Hi everybody and welcome to Heel Heat. It's a top 10 Heel Heat top 10 show. My name is George Coles. This is my tag team partner, James Storm. Ah, good one. Gary was, Rhodes, everybody. That was a viewer request. That wasn't my pick. Ah. Now the top 10 of this week, um, we're pretty much going to, on the next several top 10s, we're going to go through our history as wrestling fans. And we're going to break it down by decade. Now the first decade we can really talk about is the first one we kind of got a little bit of watching mostly from videos um, this is the decade from 1970 to 1980 and I'll go ahead and let you start it off Gary we're gonna start off at number 10 and we're probably gonna catch some hell for this but Vern Gagne not catching hell because he's on the list but because he's so low I think Vern was bigger in the 60s than in the 70s so that's why I mean he's still a top draw that's why he's in the top 10 but it does, he just doesn't really have what it takes anymore to reach to the top five or, or in that area. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. Vern was a monster um, in the 60s, and most of the recognition he got in the 70s was based off of his 60s character. Um, he did push himself into some world title reigns during the time, which brings him on the list. He still was a great draw, and... If AWA was still running, Vern would probably still be a draw. Exactly. And uh, the number nine guy is the fat man himself, the son of a plumber, Dusty Rhodes. The soul patch on his chest, or on his ribs. Started off the decade in a, in a tremendous tag team, Dusty Rhodes and Dick Murdoch, as a, what were they, the Texas Outlaws? Yeah. West, or the West Texas Outlaws? Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Dirty Dusty Rhodes was his name, and Dirty Dick Murdoch. Started off as a heel, turned in, into a face. By the end of the decade, he was a world champion in the NWA, which at the time was the biggest belt in the world. And he also made a event in Madison, Madison Square Garden for the WWF title against. against Superstar, which was a very big draw that night. Yes, it definitely was. Now we're getting out of the showmanship and actually into the skill, I think, when we mentioned number eight. Jack Briscoe, one of the best world champions there was as far as technical skill goes. Uh, first Native American world champion, too. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thing. I, I, you just blew my mind right there. Um, Jack Briscoe is a guy that kind of is being overlooked with time. Jerry Briscoe stayed on TV as a stooge and as other things, but Jack Briscoe was ten times a wrestler. Jerry was, and that's saying a lot because Jerry was Jerry's awesome. phenomenal, too. Jack Briscoe was the 70s generation's Kurt Angle. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. And it's kind of had the, the look of a Randy Orton, too, because he had a, 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 a pretty boy look to him. He does an all-American look. Exactly. Clean-cut guy. Um, and he wrestled for Oklahoma. Exactly. In college. Now, the number seven guy is one of my favorites. Go figure. He's in... You know, as we know why, when he gets into the 90s show, um, Terry Funk, the dude from the Double Cross Ranch. I think Terry, again, just like Jack Briscoe, Terry and his brother Dory were both very influential, but I, I give the nod to Terry. Terry in the 70s really, he began the 70s as a technical wrestler, just like his brother, and ended at, at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, he started into the the more brawling, which brought us into the hardcore, Terry. Terry evolved with the times, and that's one thing a lot of these guys back then didn't do. That's what made Terry so great, and he crossed over into movies, television, and everything else, too. Yep, he definitely did. He was in, what, like three or four Stallone movies, wasn't he? He was in that. He was on uh, Quantum Leap a couple times, or at least once. He was in Roadhouse. He was in a lot yeah. of stuff. Yeah. Now, we're getting to number six, one of the longest reigning... WWF champions. Reigned so long they changed the title name. Exactly. Bob Backlund. Bob Backlund was a hell of a wrestler. He wasn't much on the mic, but as far as in the ring, at that point and in that time, there were not too many better than him. No, Bob Backlund was great. Um, he carried the flag for, for Vince McMahon Sr.'s company. He was a guy that 
could be counted on to go out there and give a five-star match damn near every night. Um, and a and thing that a lot of people say going back on it is he was so much faster than everybody else. If you kind of look at some of his matches, he kind of matched, or he kind of wrestled at a modern day pace, if you really look yes. at it. He was ahead of his time. Even when he came back in 94, he was still better than half the roster there in his 40s. Exactly. And uh, the match he had with Scott Hall, Razor Ramon at WrestleMania, that was an excellent match. And the one with, uh, with Bret Hart, too, when he won the championship. But the thing that disappointed me about that is, it, and going off subject because we're talking about the 70s, was um, when he lost to Diesel, he lost in five, what is it, nine seconds? Eight seconds. Eight seconds he lost to Diesel after putting on a, what was it, like a 30-minute match with Bret Hart? Oh, yeah, he had to win Bret in the freaking cross-face chicken wing for over ten minutes. Yeah, I mean, it, it just a little bit disappointing, but Bob Backlund, our number six guy, he was a hell of a wrestler. Um... Sadly, a lot more people know him as a crazy Mr. Backlund character. I though. still like that character, too, though. I do, too, but I'm saying there was more to him. All right. Well, our number five guy is the the one true giant in in wrestling, Andre the Giant. And what what can you really say about Andre? Most people know him from WrestleMania three. The 70s was when Andre was at his absolute peak when he was wrestling three, four, five guys in the ring at the same time. He was dominating. He had went everywhere. He was a true attraction. He would come to the Carolinas once a year. He'd go to New York once a year. He'd go to Memphis once a year, go to Texas once a year, go to AWA once a year, go to Japan once a year. And every time you seen him, he drew and he... He stacked a card, basically. And see, that's what I mean. That's why I think he was so much better than Paul White. And I don't think Paul White is a better wrestler than him. Big Show, of right. course. But the thing is, that made Andre so great is because he'd just be here for a little bit of time and come back in another year. You know, you don't want to see a guy like that all the time. Don't get me wrong. He, you know, he was cool. But they, they, that marketing, that was the best thing that you could kind of say about Andre was his marketing skill. Well, and he was great with the kids. And it, it, was was a a baby it was a different era at the time. It was the, you know, it was the territory system oh, yeah. was still working. There were no tape traders back then. And it was ar arguably Andre the Giant was the biggest of the territory wrestlers, the biggest draw at least. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're going to talk about draw. Number four, one of the best talkers in the business. Well, draw talk, but anyways. Um, superstar Billy Graham. 20 Did, years too soon? Exactly. I mean, uh, you could take the batshit craziness that he is now, for the most part, take it aside, and you look at that guy, and he, like his DVD said, he was 20 years too soon. This man was cutting promos that should be cut today back in the 70s. Oh, yeah. Uh, this man was selling out. Uh, I mean, he was the first big heel that Vince, um, well, that was Vince Sr. that had him then. Yeah. That was Vince's, you know, they had a long run. He had nine, a nine-month run. It wasn't like, a, you know, just to hold it for this, wait till Bruno gets it back or anything like that. I mean, this and he beat Bruno San Martino for it. Yeah. And another thing about Superstar, he's one of the first guys to actually put a little bit more color. Usually, up until that point, Trumps were all like one solid color. Or if they had anything, they had a stripe on them mm -hmm. and either wore long trunks or shorts. Bruno, or I'm sorry, you said him, Bruno. I'm sorry. Superstar actually would wear tie-dye trunks, a tie-dye shirt matching the earrings, so much so that Jesse the Body Ventura and Hulk Hogan both credit him with their style. And if you look, he's kind of, if you put the three of them next to each other, he's kind of in the middle. Jesse There's has a little bit, Hogan has a little bit. You, you know, you forgot Scott Steiner, too. Scott Steiner oh, really wow. emulated him. When Scott Steiner turned into Big Papa Punk, he blatantly ripped him off. And that's not saying a bad thing. He just stole the gimmick wholeheartedly. Well, that shows you how great the guy was, you know? He, I mean, he was the best talker there the was. The selection of perfection. The number one selection. <laughs> he was the best talker of the 70s. I can't think of anyone better. The only one that could compare would be Dusty Rhodes and... It was still. Oh, nice. They sold out together too yeah. at the Madison Square Garden. You yeah. know, go figure. And our our next guy is the guy that dominated in the WWF in the 70s, and that was Bruno San Martino. What can you say about the guy? The guy is a legitimate legend. Um, the top name on everybody's list on a guy that should be in the WWE Hall of Fame that isn't. And the the guy just if you 
if you could sell out the Garden back then, that was the biggest thing you could do in wrestling other than being the NWA champion. Right. And Bruno sold out the Garden numerous times. He, he, sold he, out had, a record. he had the record until Hogan, right? And then Hogan. I think, I think so. Then Austin beat Hogan out. But Bruno, I mean, he was a guy that New York was the biggest territory, WWF was the biggest territory, and Bruno was the biggest star, and he makes it on this list for that reason. All right, well, our number two, I'm a big fan of the company. George always gets on me about it. But during the 70s, this company was on fire in their hay, in the, in the, and in their heyday. Uh, the superstar is Nick Bockwinkle, and the company was AWA. Nick Bockwinkle was before Flair. He was what Flair ended up being, I think. In, in a, matter of, a matter of speaking, the, the four horsemen Flair. Uh, Bockwinkle was just one of the guys that would just take control in the ring. I loved watching all of his matches. Oh, Bockwinkle was an absolute professional. And the thing of it was, he was a guy that would come out with the three-piece suit, the, the $500 suit on the uh, $10,000 Rolex. And he would he was the first guy that really put intelligence into wrestling. He had the biggest vocabulary of the 70s. Yes. I'll give him that. And so good that even, you know, 40 years later, Chris Jericho, well not four, but almost 40 years later, Chris Jericho ripped off that gimmick when he quit being Y2J and started being Chris Jericho. Yeah. And it still flew. Yeah. And and he's one of my absolute favorite guys ever in the, in the history of wrestling was Nick Bockwinkle. The only guy that I feature above him is going to be our number one guy that we, we speak about a little bit. But Nick Bockwinkle is... I would say, in my opinion, the most underrated wrestler in the history of wrestling. Oh, yeah. So much of what you see today, heel-wise, comes from Nick Bockwinkle and what he was doing back in the 70s, even going all the way back to the 60s. Well, what kind of pissed me off, and it was cool in a way, but when they put all those AWA guys in the Hall of Fame and they didn't get the big nod, I can't remember who got the big nod that year, but Nick Bockwinkle should have had the big nod that year. Well, I mean, he ran the company. I mean, he just... He didn't get he doesn't like you just said he doesn't get the respect he deserves. No. And we hope that you if you watch this kind of you know look feel that feel that you know. I, I really love for them to do one of the DVDs on him. I think it would be a great watch. I mean the guy wrestled for over thirty years. He and one of the biggest things and even into the eighties and going off topic a little bit again. Go into the 80s, the, his, one of the biggest feuds in the 80s, in my opinion, because there wasn't much feuds in WWF. Mm -hmm. The big feud, I thought, was Kurt Henning versus Nick Bockwinkle, the, the up-and-coming superstar versus the aging champion. And it was a, it was kind of like a, re, not a rehash, because I don't want to take anything away from him, because Kurt Henning is my favorite wrestler, um, of Bockwinkle and Vern Gagne. When Bockwinkle <coughs> was coming in, and, and Gagne was on his way out. You know, the guy was, you, you can't find a, a shitty match from Nick Bockwinkle. I'll just put it that way. Even He made Hulk Hogan look good when Hulk Hogan was green. Yep. That's saying quite a bit. He made everybody look good, and he's a consummate professional, and again, he's one of the best heels that ever did it. If you look at even CM Punk, CM Punk now stealing a lot of Bockwinkle stuff. Whenever any professional wrestler says, I'm better than you, they're copying Dick Bockwinkle pretty much. Yeah. I mean, I mean, honestly, just just take it for what it is, because that's how he cut his promos. Exactly. And now, before we go on to our number one guy, we're going to tell you the best of the rest, the guys that just barely didn't make our list. These aren't in any particular order. Um, these guys are the guys that, for one one reason or other, just didn't make it onto the list. And I'm going to let you start that off. Well, I'm going to start off with one of my favorites, Stan Delariat Hanson. This guy here ran Japan. And just ran buck wild. And, and he, he had the, the huge angle where he broke Bruno San Martino's back. Exactly. And he's one of, you know, I'm a JBL mark too, I ain't gonna lie. And JBL, his wrestling persona was, was Stan Larry Hansen. So, of course, I have to like Stan. There you go. And I'm gonna talk about a guy that I also really like. I talked about his brother a little bit earlier, Dory Funk Jr. I loved the guy. He was a tremendous worker. Not quite as good as his brother, but not saying anything bad about him. Dory Funk was great. He carried on well into the 90s. Oh, he was an awesome performer. Jesse the Body Ventura, one of the yeah. best talkers in the business. And I think if it wasn't for his uh, problem with the legs, or the leg, the blood clot he had, he probably would have been a WWE champion. 
Oh yeah. Uh, because the, could you imagine the the angles he would have had against Hogan? This the thing that I think put him down on our list, and this is not a knock because I like tag team wrestling. Exactly. Is most of the seventies he was in a tag team, a tremendous tag team with Adrian Adonis the east-west connection and that's kind of what knocked him off of this list because we're basically just doing singles wrestlers but he was a great wrestler now the, another guy i want to speak of was ivan koloff the russian bear the first real fed threat to bruno san martino so much so that he ended bruno's reign as world champion and he became world champion himself and one more uh, great performer was baron von Raschke. This guy here, he was a legitimate looking monster in the ring. He looks, you know, even if you look at him now, he still looks like a monster or something out of a, a freaking Stephen King movie. But it, there was no one I could say a bad thing about the guy. No, and he was the master of the claw. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Baron was a tremendous worker. <clears throat> you know, it's uh, actually funny looking at this list. A lot of these guys, and it was something you just mentioned, and I didn't think about it while we were writing this. The 70s, a lot of these guys either pr primarily wrestled for the AWA or had big, ang big angles in the AWA, showing you how important that promotion actually was to the history of wrestling. Okay. And now the last guy on our, our best of the rest was Abdullah the Butcher. What can you say about Abdullah? With Abdullah, um, guys like Stan Hansen, Abdullah the Butcher, Terry Funk, uh, Bruiser Brody a little bit later on, they were the guys that really brought on the hardcore style of wrestling. And, He's probably the forefather, him and the Sheik, the well, original Sheik. Well, the thing with Abdullah that made him so big, too, is I think he, he did the same as Andre did. Yes. He wrestled territory to territory, and he's even admitted it. That's what makes him a better draw. When you see Abdullah the Butcher every week, you're going to get tired of it. But you see Abdullah the Butcher once and a year. Abdullah was very limited ring-wise. Oh, yeah. His, 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 his finishing move was stabbing you with a fork. I mean... He was limited, but he was a tremendous draw everywhere he went, and he never had to cut a promo. No. Now, now that we're done with the best of the rest, our, our number one guy in, from the decade of the 70s was Handsome Harley Race. He, the guy was so good that by the time he made it to the WWF at the end of his career, they, they made the king for him because he was the king of wrestling. Oh, he was. He was. If you don't would judge him by the Harley race you saw then. No. You look at the, try to find some old tapes or anything like that from the 70s. The best example of anything that I could think of on DVD is the Starcade where he wrestles Flair. Starcade 1. With, which is at, is one of the my favorite matches of all time. The guy is, is tremendous. I think Harley and Nick Bockwinkel are the two guys that once I really understood what wrestling was about, you know, not just watching it as a casual fan, once I really understood these are the guys that went, wow, these guys really get it. Mm -hmm. And these guys really know how to do, are, are masters of their craft. They're, they're ring psychologists, man. They, they, they ran everything. They could, turn to, they could run the crowd. They could run their opponent. They could run the referee. These guys just made everything look real. And that's, and that's what you know, everybody knows. It's yep. not, I don't like saying the word fake. Everybody it's knows fixed. It's fixed. Everybody knows the outcome. But these guys were like... Uh, who, who hasn't said it the best? That they're kind of like composers. Yeah. You know, they, these guys like him, Bret Hart is another one. I'm not a giant Bret Hart fan, but he's along the lines of these guys. And Harley Race, he was a seven-time NWA champion when being a multiple-time champion didn't happen. And Harley kept getting the belt back because it was a guy they could trust, a guy that, <laughs> you know, if someone wanted to shoot on Harley, they weren't going to go anywhere because Harley was going to break their arm. I remember... Uh, it's not changing, so it's talking about Harley. When uh, Bobby Heenan and all them got to the Hall of Fame, and he says, when I heard me and Harley were getting in, inducted, he said, I thought we were getting indicted. <laughs> That's the way, you know, because the way they were, you know. Yeah. And, and tremendous guy, um, one of the best wrestlers of all time. Again, like we said with Bockwinkel, one of the guys that any heel that you watch today stole something from Harley. Um, Triple H wholesale stole, move stole mannerism stole a lot of things not not saying it's a bad thing no rick flair's respect. gimmick is copied directly off of buddy roberts and understandably triple h is a tremendous worker a lot of what he does is harley racist stuff exactly he you know the harley race me you know yeah. um these guys it, it goes in a cycle yeah. and, and another generation of guys will come and they'll be like man 
you know, who's going to be the next Harley race or the next Triple H, you know, and, that, and that's how it's going to work, you know, it's every seven years or so, there's a new kind of big revolution. Exactly. But basically, that's what we got to say about our top ten of the decade of this of the decade of the seventies. If you guys have any comments, uh, let hit us up on our Facebook, hit us up on our Twitter, hit us down where down there. Put it right down there in the comments. Let us know what you think. Let us know if we left somebody out, if we put somebody down too low, up too high. Tell us what you think about it. And these are just our opinions. Yes. You know? Now, um, and before we get out of there, get out of this. As you can see, I'm wearing a Colt Cabana shirt. I just want to say shout out to Colt Cabana. Um, save Colt's finger, everybody. And save I, a finger. That's pretty much all I got to say. My name's George Colts. Gary Rhodes. This has been a Heel Heat Top 10 review.